He came with high hopes. He has left, it seems, with no breakthrough. The US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, has just finished his ninth visit to the Middle East, attempting to negotiate a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. But the war goes on, the killing goes on, and pessimism now prevails. We'll be talking to Middle East expert Daniel Levy, who served in the Israeli Defence Force and has been an Israeli government peace negotiator. And in such a world of conflict, both in the Middle East and elsewhere, the phenomenon of Taylor Swift is a genuinely positive force, um, bringing fans together, as well as um, the political and economic impact of her tour. We'll be discussing the grand finale of the European leg of her ERAS tour, which culminated at Wembley Stadium last night. And here in the studio, we're going to have our very own correspondent, Genevieve Hall-Allen, who was at the concert last night and is going to tell us all about it. Hopefully she's dabbed away her tears by now now. Welcome to The Daily Tea with me, Kamal Ahmed. And me, Camilla Tana. Camilla, it appears still incredibly bleak in the Middle East. A hundred people killed every day in Gaza. The attacks on Israel continuing a wider regional war possible. And no sign of this imminent ceasefire deal. Uh, Anthony Blinken, he's the US's most senior diplomat. He went to the Middle East with such positive uh, noises being made around the fact that Israel and Hamas, together with the other interlocutors, uh, Qatar and Egypt, were somehow going to agree some type of bridging deal, which meant that a journey towards a ceasefire could happen in earnest. After visiting Israel, after meeting the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, after travelling then to Egypt, he's now left. But there seems to be now a much more a negative sense of, is there any way that we can bring Israel and Hamas together? Just to kick off our discussion before we get to Mr. Levy and to the families uh, of the hostages and their demands, let's just hear a little bit from uh, Mr. Blinken in his press conference that he gave at the end of his journey when he talks about what the ceasefire initiative is trying to achieve and why action is so urgent. Uh, no, we're never, we're never giving up. But what we know is this. With every passing day uh, that there's not an agreement, um, two things uh, can happen. One is, of course, uh, more hostages uh, can perish. Uh, and second, intervening events come along that may make things even more difficult, if, if not impossible. And we've, uh, we've experienced that throughout this process. So. There's a, 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 the fierce urgency of now. That's what I think we're all feeling. And we do see this as the best opportunity to finally get this over the finish line. <laughs> we'll never give up on it. But the, the challenge is, the longer this goes on, uh, the more, uh, again, hostages will, will suffer. That was Anthony Blinken there. Now, the Israeli leader, Benjamin Netanyahu, laid out his case when he addressed Congress last month. The war in Gaza could end tomorrow if Hamas surrenders, disarms, and returns all the hostages. But if they don't, Israel will fight until we destroy Hamas's military capabilities, end its rule in Gaza, and bring all our hostages home. That's what total victory means, and we will settle for nothing less. The day, the day after we defeat Hamas, a new Gaza can emerge. My vision for that day is of a demilitarized and de-radicalized Gaza. Let's talk now to Daniel Levy. He's president of the U.S. Middle East Project and a former Israeli negotiator with the Palestinians under Prime Minister Ehud Barak and also Oslo B under Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. Uh, hello, Mr. Levy. Thank you so much for joining the Daily Tea podcast. Could we kick off? Dan, give us a little bit, Mr. Levy, of your background. You've obviously been involved in very deep negotiations. What are the two sides... <coughs> in negotiations where conflict is always so ever-present, trying to achieve? 
Well, it's good to be with you. I, I think there's a significant distinction to draw between a negotiation where at least what's written on the tin is these are peace talks still in the context of a, a brutal, ugly conflict versus negotiations where these are cessation of hostilities of a specific immediate kind, prisoner exchanges, without in any way for either party constituting an on-ramp to peace. That's a, that's a quite different space to be in. Uh, my experience, uh, perhaps I'm, I'm fortunate and happy to say, even though it ultimately was not a successful peace outcome, uh, was in the former, uh, not in the latter. And sadly, we have not for an awfully long time been in actual peace talks. And there were quite a lot of positive noises about the latest round of negotiations coming from the US administration um, in, in the last few days. But this now seems to have faded a bit and the hope of, of, of having a, a breakthrough this time around is perhaps not quite as strong as it was. Could you just talk us through what the sticking points are now, um, both for the Israeli government and for Hamas? Well, indeed. And it would be useful to put that optimism that perhaps existed some days ago in a context, because I think it will help people to make sense of, of why this apparent pendulum swing from great hope to apparently yet again dashed hope. I don't think one has to be a cynic to look at this and say, what was going on? And the Biden administration faced two very urgent headaches. One, a geopolitical headache, which is that after the latest round of um, provocative Israeli extrajudicial killings, uh, one in Tehran, uh, the swearing-in ceremony where the political head of Hamas was the guest of the Iranian government, taken out. Now, they haven't acknowledged it. I don't think anyone questions who was behind it. Uh, taking him out in an official guest house. The second, uh, a deputy commander of Hezbollah in Beirut. After those, there was an expectation that one might be headed towards a broader and perhaps all-out regional war. So first, there was an effort to buy time to prevent that. Part of that effort was to say, hey, there are really serious ceasefire talks. That's something you guys have said, that if you get a Gaza ceasefire, we can de-escalate regionally. Do you want to be the ones blamed for that failing? At the same time, America was beefing up its military presence in the region as a threat deterrence to the Iranian access. One thing. Secondly, you might have noticed there's a political convention going on in Chicago this week, which is linked to an election that's taking place in the United States in November. All eyes on Chicago, Democrat convention. What is the most divisive issue inside the Democrat political ferment, inside their own base, their constituency in this election? It's how Gaza and the Middle East have been managed. So if you could go to that convention with a positive spin coming out of the Middle East, Blinken's in the region, we're getting there. And you could push back, and the hope is you, if you push it back long enough, it doesn't happen, an Iranian response. You'd also be giving Israel some uh, ability to continue its freedom of operation if you prevented that response. Those are all really good boxes to tick for a Biden administration with one huge cloud hanging over this, which is if you don't actually get the ceasefire, all of that can unravel. And unfortunately, the optimism around the ceasefire itself was not firmly grounded because, and to answer your question, there has been a quite consistent position on the part of Hamas throughout the negotiations, which is that any beginning of an implementation of a ceasefire has to offer a clear path to a permanent ceasefire. Not a few weeks, 
hostage returns, some Palestinian prisoners getting out, and then back to the mayhem and the destruction uh, that we have seen. On the Israeli side, the, the question has been all along, what is the balance of interests inside the system and specifically for Prime Minister Netanyahu? And what you hear from security establishment officials and from many of the hostage families in Israel is that for Netanyahu, the priority is not a deal, is not the return of hostages, which begs the question, why? For Netanyahu, his coalition, his governing coalition, Israel always runs according to coalition governments. I think people will be familiar with the idea uh, that there are some really unprecedentedly extreme members of uh, this coalition government. The names Ben Gabir and Smotrich may be familiar to some folks. So he would endanger his coalition. And the other key thing going on here, and there are other factors, but let me focus on this one, is that Netanyahu has gone some way towards reviving his own political salience and longevity when people after October 7th thought he is toast politically. Plus, people may remember he's standing trial. So political collapse may also mean prison for Netanyahu. He has done that by portraying himself as the wartime leader Israel needs. To do that, you have to continue the war. And so the, the sense amongst a broad spectrum, not of his home base, but a broad spectrum of the center and the security establishment in Israel is that for Netanyahu, continuing the war, an open-ended war with varying degrees of intensity, serves his po politics. That seems, Mr. Levy, to suggest, as many people are saying, you know, with you, that Mr. Netanyahu doesn't actually want a ceasefire and that the line that um, the uh, what he wants to achieve is the elimination of Hamas and security for Israel is never going to be achievable. And that's actually convenient for the prime minister. Look, it's it's a it's a dreadful conclusion to reach. Uh, it's a conclusion that many of the families of the hostages have reached um, in very painful circumstances. It's certainly a conclusion that Palestinians and others in the region have reached as, as the death toll keeps ticking up of civilians, daily mass civilian casualty events in, uh, at the hands of Israel. The, the number exceeds 40,000. The humanitarian crisis is appalling. Virtually everyone displaced, shunted from supposed safe zone to safe zone, which are never safe. So the, the reading is that indeed for Netanyahu, when he looks at that ledger, the side of the equation which says do a deal, get a ceasefire, means political risk inside his coalition, means that he can't pursue these other goals. And on the other side of the ledger, because I think this is really relevant for US policy, but perhaps also for UK policy, is I don't really pay much of a cost. The domestic political opposition, and there are intense protests, but they're not, first of all, they're not as large as the protests prior to October 7. There was a mass movement against Netanyahu's judicial reforms. But all that opposition doesn't add up to a political threat to Netanyahu. And therefore, what you have is the families, many of the families who are out protesting have turned round to Netanyahu and say, you are torpedoing the talks. And an interesting event, if I can just share with you, uh, as you may, have, um, you may have covered this, six, uh, the bodies of six Israelis who are being held in Gaza were retrieved in a military operation um, in Khan Yunis in Gaza, in tunnels under Khan Yunis. Sometimes when this happens, the, 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 the immediate go-to place in, in the Israeli kind of ferment is to say, look at this amazing military operation. We managed to retrieve six of the bodies. But the immediate pushback, uh, especially by the families and others, was 
not more body bags. That's not great. This is this is an indication of the scale of the failure and the disaster. But that is something that Netanyahu continues to stare down in the absence of the incentive structure changing because there is an absence of him facing an international cost of sufficient solidity for continuing on this path. I mean, I, I could... Look, I'll give you three headlines in the in the Israeli papers today. Nadav, Nadav Eyal, who's a main correspondent in Yudiot, writes that none of Israel's top security officials who are involved in this believe that the prime minister is making the effort. Uh, Amos Harel, who is the um, Haaretz military correspondent, has written the following. Netanyahu prefers hostages in body bags over risking his own political life. And I won't, but I, but I could go on. And that's what Israelis, uh, who are very informed on this, are saying. And could you tell us a bit about the agendas of the other parties to these um, ceasefire talks? So w what are the sticking points for Hamas? What about Egypt and Qatar? What is it that they're saying as part of these negotiations? That, uh, or what is it about the current Biden deal that is unpalatable to them and, and means Hamas hasn't been in a position to, to accept this latest uh, bridging agreement, as the US are calling it? Yeah, absolutely. That That's really important. I think on the mediators, I don't want to be dismissive, but it's easier to cover that because this is not a team of equals, right? So you have the three mediating parties, the US, Qatar and Egypt, but the US is very much in, in a primus inter pares role here. Uh, the US has the potential leverage over Israel. The US has relations with Egypt and Qatar, which are important to the US, but, 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 but there's not a symmetry here. Um, so one gets the impression that they're doing their best, but they're going along with this. Um, on, on, in terms of the other mediating parties. Now, when it comes to Hamas, I would say probably three things. First of all, Hamas does have interests, constituency, politics. And it, you know, it's easy to dismiss all of that as, well, this is how we've defined Hamas, terror organization. So all of that is illegitimate. I think that's the wrong approach. I think, you know, Israel can commit war crimes and still have legitimate security interests, which is precisely what the ICC chief prosecutor and the, uh, the International Criminal Court and the International Court of Justice are saying in terms of what has happened in these last months. Um, Hamas, likewise, can conduct criminal activities, violate international law and have interests that are legitimate and interests that will need to be met if Hamas is going to sign up to a deal. Secondly, Hamas sees an interest in the potential expanding of the scope of this conflict. That doesn't mean they won't accept a ceasefire if the terms are reasonable. But right now, they're not going to accept a ceasefire when things could expand and when the terms are unreasonable. And in terms of the specific proposals, which is the third element, the U.S. President Biden on May 31 gave a speech, and that was the last time I was asked to give interviews about, hey, is there going to be a deal here? You know, please uh, give us reasons for optimism. And what happened then was that after engagement with Hamas, the U.S. put forward a proposal which for the first time created a link between an initial ceasefire and a permanent ceasefire. What has happened subsequently is that they have walked that back and they seem to be mediating not between Israel and Hamas, but between competing camps inside Israel. And so Netanyahu's statements this week are he thinks he's finally convinced the US that Israel needs certain things which Israel's own security officials disagree with and which are poison pills, are there because they know Hamas will not accept them. And therefore Hamas has said, we supported the plan at the end of May. This is not the same plan. This is not a plan we can go along with. And unfortunately, the US has placed itself in a position which is the maximum comfort zone for Netanyahu, where he knows that this is a US that he can easily manage because they will blame Hamas. And why this is particularly dangerous is when you build an expectation 
and that expectation is dashed, especially when it's at such a sensitive moment anyway in the region, this could actually lead to the opposite to what they intended. And it could send the signal to the axis of resistance that now might be the time to escalate. I hope that's not where we're going, but I think one has to bear that in mind. Mr. Levy, given, given your um, experience, you've spoken about the incentive structure and could that be changed? Can you give us any route into the future that feels rather more optimistic than the situation we appear to be in at the moment where both sides of the conflict don't have high incentives to do a deal? Yeah, and, and that's, that's crucial because you, it, it shouldn't even take a negotiation to get beyond this. The, the, the Israelis, the Israeli civilians being held in Gaza should be released anyway. Israel's violations of international law in its actions in Gaza, the use of starvation as a weapon of war, the indiscriminate killing of civilians, the prevention of humanitarian assistance, all these things should end anyway. They need to end. It seems they will end through a political process eventually. So let's look at what those alternatives are. I think there are three. One is where I hope we don't go which is there are battlefield developments which change this dynamic. In other words, one could envisage a more dramatic regional military escalation, which brings into play the kind of international effort to bring this to a rapid close, which we haven't seen thus far. One scenario, we want to prevent that. A second scenario, which I, I won't go into the details of, but there are frictions there are problems inside Netanyahu's ruling coalition, which are not primarily to do with the subject we've been discussing. Israel has ultra-Orthodox uh, coalition partners who are unhappy about other things going on to do with the needs of their own community, to do with enlistment in the military. It could be that detached from the conversation we've been having, the coalition collapses and a coalition comes into power which says, not we're having peace tomorrow, we're ending the occupation tomorrow, but we need to get the draw a line under uh, what has happened to the Israelis being held in Gaza. We need to get a ceasefire, we need to rebuild. That's the second scenario. The third scenario, which is the one that gives agency to the external community of actors and primarily to the US, is that Netanyahu's calculation, as I referenced earlier, the ledger, the incentive disincentive structure for Netanyahu changes by way of him feeling that he has a problem if he does not go along with a deal that's bigger than his internal problem. And specifically, if one puts one finger on this, Israel could not continue this war were it not for the conveyor belt of weapons that have been sent from the US. There's a UK piece here in terms of the... Um, uh, making public the uh, advice inside the Foreign Office on whether the UK is in breach of its own international humanitarian law considerations and its own export licensing to Israel. But the big player here is the US. So if the dynamic from the outside were to impact Israel's calculation, that might lead either to Netanyahu belatedly saying, OK, I have no choice, or to the unravelling of that coalition politics in other ways. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and all your insight and wisdom on this incredibly complex process. Um, we really appreciate your time. Coming up after the break, the positive phenomenon that is Taylor Swift. Well, now we've got Genevieve Hall Allen from our very own politics team. She was at the final night of the ERAS tour last night. Genevieve, could you tell us a bit about what it was like? Well, uh, Kula, I have to say it was probably the best concert experience that I've ever I've ever had. And I've seen other artists at Wembley before, but it was on another level. I think calling it a concert doesn't really encapsulate what the experience is. I mean, you know, I've I've always been a, a fan of Taylor Swift. I remember watching her music videos for, you know, uh, her early music like Love Story and You Belong With Me when I must have been about 10 or 11 years old on YouTube. Um, and I've kind of followed her music ever since. And it was it was a musical odyssey, really, through 
um, all of her albums and it it was also just the collective experience of it all I mean her fans and her her the, the Swifties are there is a sense of community to it that I, I I think is quite rare and it was just a really joyous experience um, and something that yeah, I'm still kind of reeling from, to be honest. It's a three hours of her music and you just kind of, it's hit after hit after hit and it was just brilliant. It was brilliant fun. I'm so glad you mentioned the Swifties because I also <laughs> wanted to ask, to the uninitiated, could you explain a bit about the cult of Taylor Swift, this kind of phenomenon and just the power she holds over her, her fans? It is absolutely a, a phenomenon. I mean, it is all about that sense of connection, I think, with her and her music i mean i remember at the beginning of the concert she said you know these are i I write about my feelings and my experiences as well as kind of scenarios that i've dreamt up in my head and you may think about your experiences whatever they may be when you listen to her music Uh, and that is it it's a really personal connection that she manages to have with each and every person not only in the concerts of which there were 92,000 of us yesterday, but it still felt like a really kind of intimate um, experience. Um, and also it's it, it's the sense that she's been around, as I say, for a long time, I mean, almost two decades. And, and it, we feel like we know her, we've seen her grow up, we've seen her go through these various stages of her life, her love life, her eras, I suppose. Um, and... You know, what what comes from that is a real deep sense of what I, I, I would say is kind of Taylor Swift law, if you like. You know, the, the idea that we know so much about her history and what her, informed her. I mean, we can think about, for example, her her romantic relationships, which have been plastered all over the media for years because she is a woman in, 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 the, in the public life. Um, and then her songs will come out um, about you know, falling in love or breakups and things. And, and fans can often, will often speculate or look for little clues about what, what is this about? You know, where, who could this be talking about? Where has this come from in her life? Um, and that's it. It's the whole picture of her as a, as a person beyond that music. We have the connection to the music and the lyrics themselves, but also, yeah, to her, to her as a person. And and despite the fact that the concert last night felt like an enormous spectacle and you could feel the kind of size of it, the the staging, the pyrotechnics, all the dancers, it was still, at the end of the day, her talking to each and every fan who was in there as though that personal connection was, was there. And I think that is really key to being, yeah, to, to, to the Swifty fandom, the Swifty phenomenon, I suppose. She does seem to create great emotional uh, connection. I'm trying just my best not to sound like Grandpa Kamal <laughs> on this uh, bit of the uh, podcast. But speaking to Neve Walsh, uh, our social media producer, she was talking about it this morning in our 10 o'clock meeting, which we have every day, that she was in floods of tears, that there's a kind of a connecting point, And she was um, next to a young child, I think a six-year-old, you know, watching it. And the 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 young child was so connected to what was going on on the stage and the whole spectacle seems to be remarkable. And also she does have, with a very small P, and sometimes with a capital P, a sort of political role as well. And she's an antidote almost, isn't she, Camilla, to what we've been talking about earlier in this podcast. You know, you've got war and conflict and distress and she approaches the world with generosity, with openness about her feelings, with allowing people to talk and connect and actually she has there is a a societal role for her it seems that particularly for young people but actually to have anybody who in this moment of such distress and and conflict that there's someone like that who is completely on the other side of the scales i absolutely agree with that and i think it was really felt for the fans who went to any of her shows among the fans themselves, I mean, it was just such a, a, it felt like a community there, really. I mean, there's a a, a big thing among 
concert goers where you will go with lots of friendship bracelets that you've made, kind of homemade ones. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to make my own before I went. Um, <laughs> but I saw many, many people kind of young and old uh, with these friendship bracelets and they would go up to other concert goers who they just didn't know and were swapping them and talking. And I even saw some people giving them to kind of Wembley arena staff and and things like that. There is, It does just feel like a sort of haven of kind of joyousness, um, which, yeah, as you say, is is something that is kind of needed right now, I think, beyond just her, her good hits, <laughs> her pop <laughs> tunes. It's interesting thinking about that political role because I think it can take on different meanings as well. For example, um, I think people are kind of waiting with bated breath to see who she'll endorse for the US presidential election. And yes, some of her fans are quite young and not old enough to vote, but her fan base is absolutely huge. So the kind of symbolic of importance of, of who she endorses um, for US president actually um, does potentially could have a sort of a real world effect, the kind of symbolism of that. Yeah, I absolutely think so. And I mean, she, she you know, she, she has endorsed in US presidential elections before. So she backed the Democrats in 2020 um, in the US race. And um, she's also criticised Trump pro- publicly before. I mean, she criticised his approach to the Black Lives Matter protests in the States. Um, I think she accused him of stoking the fires of white supremacy and racism. Um, so... You know, in terms of who she may come out and support, I don't think that there would be a huge amount of surprise. Um, But as you say, she is massive. She's absolutely massive. And so to have that backing would be a huge amount of momentum for for the Harris uh, camp. And, and, And also she has been, as you say, she's got a young audience, but also she has got a young audience among young US adults who if she can get them out to vote, and she does do this. I mean, in previous elections, she will go on her Instagram stories, for example, take a selfie with her sticker saying she's voted and say, you know, get out there, guys. So, yeah, absolutely. She would bring a huge amount of momentum and and, and she would join quite already quite illustrious list of uh, pop back, pop singing backers of, of Harris. I mean, we've got Demi Lovato, Katy Perry, John Legend. So, but I think, I think Taylor Swift would be the one that, the Dems would want to get the two yeah. big the two biggies, and I think that they have you know genuine, as you say, come in a genuine influence in what is a very tight race in America. Uh, Beyonce and Taylor Swift mm. are uh, in politics two of the most powerful people in America, and I think this phenomenon of these global powerhouses, because there is not only her music. There is not only her societal influence on conversations. There's also her economic success. I mean, she 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 is valued herself at one billion dollars. So what, eight hundred million pounds? When she did her concerts in Sweden, it actually affected inflation. So they had three huge concerts in Sweden. There was so much demand for hotel rooms, restaurants, people traveling into Sweden. It actually put their inflation up. She she affects countries' economies. She she is a phenomenon. We we said rather jokingly at the top of the program. You know, should should she be? I think it was Boris Johnson, wasn't it? Who said he wanted to be king of the world. I, I would imagine that Taylor Swift has actually got more uh, reason to demand that she's queen of the world, and that might be a rather jollier world than the one we presently live in. Absolutely. Oh, well, there's the t- there's the term Swiftonomics, and yes. uh, there's no there's no such thing yet as Borisonomics. So <laughs> she may she may be slightly ahead in in that one. I mean, yes, as you say, she. I think. Um, you know, she she has added one billion pounds to the UK economy with her dates here alone. That's 15 dates across June and August. Rachel Rees will be inviting her back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She is the growth expert. <laughs> well, absolutely. And, I, and there are other, I mean, there are in country leaders who have asked her to, to come and perform in their countries exactly for that economic boost. I mean, you've got the president of Chile, um, you've got the mayor of Budapest, both of those, um, as it stands, both of those pleas have fallen on deaf ears. But but Justin Trudeau tweeted saying, please come. And, and there have been two, there are two dates now in Canada, to, I believe two, um, at the end of the run. So yeah, she she's powerful. She has a huge, she, she has a, you know, it's seismic. You can't not know the Taylor Swift's in town when she's there. <laughs> and you the really fact can't. that she's got the next leg of her tour back in America does mean that her influence on the run into the election will be significant. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, Genevieve, I think you admitted to us that you didn't quite cry. No. <laughs> but nevertheless, as a uh, Taylor Swift fan, 
Thank you so much for joining us on The Daily Tea. And how nice as well, Camilla, to finish on a slightly more optimistic, Swiftian note. <laughs> Absolutely lovely. <laughs> Join us again tomorrow, five o'clock.